All right. Welcome, everyone, to Value Investing Live. I'm pleased to welcome our guest this week, Wynn Murray, the Vice President of the Oakmark Funds, Co-Manager of the Oakmark Select Fund, and Director of U.S. Equity Research at Harris Associates. Wynn joined Harris Associates in 2003 as an equity analyst after working in investment roles at several other firms. He holds an MBA from Georgia State University alongside a BA in Russian slash Eastern European Studies from the University of North Carolina. For those of you out in the audience, do please feel free to post in that live chat at any point throughout the presentation. Let us know where you are viewing from so we can see that you are active out there. We always appreciate that. Do keep in mind, though, that we are going to hold those questions until we get to the end of the presentation so we can jam on through that Q&A at the end. Without anything further from me, I'll go ahead and hand things over to Wynn. We can jump into the presentation today. Great. Thanks, Graham. Um, thank you guys for uh, hosting me. Uh, I am still not entirely accustomed to the uh, virtual uh, format here, but it's it's great uh, to be able to do things like this until we uh, get back to big live audiences. Um, so as Graham mentioned, I am the uh, director of US research uh, here at Harris Associates and I've been at Harris Associates for about 18 years. Um, and I know that y'all are, are familiar with value investing uh, and I don't want to be too remedial to start, but I interview a lot of analyst candidates as director of research since 2011, I've interviewed more than 600 uh, candidates either for an analyst role or for an internship or for anything in between. Um, and from my role as director of research, I am regularly seeing uh, sort of a philosophical issue that comes up um, relative to how we invest and how I think any famous investor you've ever heard of invests. And so I just want to start with this uh, first because it's very important. Uh, at Harris Associates, at the Oakmark Funds, we always think about our investments from the standpoint of an owner. And I'm going to give you an example of this. Um, uh, so, Graham, let's just say that your last name is Tiffany. Uh, your name is Graham Tiffany, and your family owns the jeweler Tiffany. Um, this is a great business. It's a private company, let's say. Uh, it was founded in the 1830s, I believe, and uh, you guys own all of it, private company. So as, as Mr. Tiffany, uh, you get approached from time to time by somebody with a big check, and they say, hey, I'd like to buy this company from you. And they say, here's, here's you know, $5 billion, $10 billion, $15 billion, and you need to decide based on your knowledge of the value of this company and all of its future cash flows, what check you would exchange uh, for the business. So let's, let's think about this for a minute. Tiffany's not a private company. Actually, it just got bought out. But for the longest time, Tiffany was a public company. And in the middle of 2018, the market was valuing Tiffany at $16.7 billion. So if it were a private company, that's the equivalent of saying, all right, Mr. Tiffany, we have a check for you for $16.7 billion. And if you want, you can sell all of the shares, and in other words, the entire company to us, in this case, the market for $16.7 billion. And if you own the business, you have to think, is this a fair price or not? But then the market says, guess what? Chinese tourism is going to be down next year. You're going to see weakness in China. Uh, and early 2018, you had great sales, which means in early 2019, your comps are not going to look that good because you're lapping really great sales. Um, and so the market says, you know what? I just told you Chinese tourism is going to be down and you have tough comps at the beginning of 19. So instead of offering you $16.7 billion for your company, I'm gonna offer you nine and a half billion. In other words, I'm gonna cut the value by 40, 42%. Now, as Graham Tiffany, as the owner of the entire business, you would look at them and you would laugh 
you would say, this is ridiculous. You were offering me almost $17 billion. And now you're telling me we're gonna have some weak Chinese tourism for a little while. And you think I'm gonna sell my 200 year old company to you for 40% less because of this data point. But that's exactly what the market did. The market basically took Tiffany's stock from about $145 down to about $95. The market basically said, instead of offering you 17 billion for the company, we're gonna offer you nine and a half. The flip side of that is, is that as an investor, instead of paying 16 and a half billion dollars for Tiffany, all you had to do was pay nine and a half. By the way, that's crazy. That's actually nuts that the market would be so emotional about what is a very stable business. Now, it's not stable necessarily annually because it'll have great sales when Wall Street bonuses are high. It'll have bad sales when, when, when the economy's in a recession, et cetera. But it's, it's essentially, as a family business, a very stable business. And yet in six months, the value changed that much. And then not a year later, LVMH came in and said, you know what? We actually do want to offer to buy Tiffany. And we're going to pay essentially 16, 17, 18 billion dollars. There are a series of offers that they made, and there was a lot of negotiation, and it took a little while. But they basically said, we do view investing like it being your family's business. We do think about it as an owner and we've done the math and this is what we're willing to offer. And Tiffany said, we've done the math and we, that's what we're willing to take. There's a lot of information value in that. That was December of 2019. In the interim, you may remember, we had a little bit of a pandemic. Now, imagine how the market would have reacted to a pandemic on Tiffany's value had the LVMH offer not been out there. We saw in the last six months of 2018, the market just, just vomited Tiffany stock down 40 something percent uh, because they were worried about Chinese tourism. But because private market value was established at a certain level and the bidder essentially never went away, although there's a lot of back and forth, they finally settled on a price at the end of the year. That was essentially where, where they, where they had, uh, agreed, where it was negotiated a year before through a pandemic without the stock falling apart in the interim. Every famous investor you've pretty much ever heard of who's had a 40 year career. So you think about it, uh, you know, obviously Warren Buffett or, or Benjamin Graham or Wally Weiss or, or the Davis family or, or David Tepper or, you know, Bill Ackman or Carl Icahn or Michael Steinhardt or pretty much, or, you know, or Sam, Sam Zell in real estate, pretty much any investor you've ever heard of in any asset class acquires their investments when the market has decided that they are very worried about something. They buy them at a big discount to what it's worth when it's out of favor, and they hold it for potentially a very long time. And then math works. The cash flows of the business come through and they are proven to be correct, and you've heard of them. Um, now, when I'm interviewing analyst candidates, what I hear a lot are stock pitches. And what they will do is they'll tell me, this is a great company, and this is why it's great, and this is what's gonna happen that's gonna be even better. But they do a very poor job frequently of telling me what it's worth, of telling me and, the price that you're paying right now is you know, a 40% discount to what it is worth. And here's how I determined what it is worth. Now there's a bit of an art to that, um, but that's where we come in. It's not a terribly difficult job, but I'll tell you what the job isn't. The job is not finding stocks that go up. What I hear all the time from people who say that they are investors essentially is a focus on What's a stock that's going to go up? Uh, and rather than value the business, 
they're analyzing news flow and they're analyzing market psychology. And you know what? That's a perfectly interesting job. Uh, you don't find a lot of people who are famous with 40 year careers who've done that, but there are a lot of people out there who, who basically are looking for stocks that are going to go up and they're analyzing news flow and psychology. We are very glad these people exist because in 2018, for instance, their concern about Chinese tourism and Tiffany's tough comps uh, sent the value of a very stable business down by 40 something percent. And you know what? They were analyzing things correctly from the standpoint of Chinese tourism was weak uh, and comps were tough in 2019. It's just that they were not thinking about the value of the business. Um, so what we do, I, so I task my analysts with finding good investment ideas. Uh, an important thing that the way we do this is all businesses essentially are just a series of cash flows. And all you're doing is you're just saying, look, what are these cash flows worth? Whether it's the restaurant down the street or the apartment building that somebody owns or the dry cleaners or McDonald's or, or, or somebody with five Ubers or any, any point in time in your life when you're trying to figure out whether you wanna make an investment or not, you should be thinking about what are the cash flows gonna look like? What we don't do is we say that the cash flows in oil and gas are different than the cash flows in software and those are different than the cash flows in retail and those are different than the cash flows in banks. Dollars are dollars, cash is cash. The way the company's generated is different, but essentially once it becomes cash flow, it's, it's the same. And so what we try to do is we just try to compare these companies to each other as a series of cash flows. And I, let me give you an example of this. Um, so I had a, I had an intern uh, one time, a very promising candidate. Uh, and actually he, he is an analyst here at the firm. But when he was an intern, uh, he was doing a really good job. And I said, okay, you know what? I'm gonna give you a tricky company to look at. Uh, this is back when DreamWorks was a public company. It's since been taken over. Um, but I said, I want you to tell me what DreamWorks is worth. And so he went back and he looked at it. And about a week later, he came to my office and he said, you know what? I'm really struggling with this one. Um, because DreamWorks comes out with two or three movies a year. And most of them are terrible. Uh, you know, you've got Mr. Peabody and Sherman and you've got Boss Baby and you've got Rise of the Guardians, although that was actually a pretty good movie. It didn't make any money. Uh, and, 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 and the DreamWorks spends 40, 60, 100 million dollars on these movies and many of them don't make their money back. But then every so often you have Shrek or you have Kung Fu Panda or you have Madagascar and they make two billion dollars. You know, it, it, it's insane, but it's unpredictable. And if you go back when they were launching the movies, they didn't know, okay, I know the past ones we launched weren't very good, but this one's gonna be great. They appear to think that all the movies have a chance to be great. And some of them just end up to be blockbusters and most don't. He said, I don't know how to forecast their cash flows because they're spending a couple hundred million dollars every year to make movies and they're losing a lot of it. And occasionally they hit a home run. He said, so here's my idea. Do you think we can put it in our uh, pharmaceutical model? And I said, well, what do you mean? And he said, okay. He said, well, so think about it. Pfizer spends all this money coming up with drugs and most of them are terrible in the sense that they do not get approved or they get, or they launch, but they have a safety issue or something. And, and, and so they spend all this money on R&D and most of them uh, do not return their R&D spend, but occasionally they come up with Lipitor or Viagra or, or a drug that becomes a six, eight, ten $10 billion annual seller for the entire life of the drug. He said, it seems to me that their cash flows follow the same pattern. And essentially each company is spending money to produce 
blockbuster results with a, a zillion failures, but the blockbusters are not forecastable. Uh, and the way we value pharmaceuticals is we just say, okay, we're not scientists. We're not going to know that the mechanism of action of the, of the small molecule the pill is better in this company than this company. No, we, we are business analysts. Uh, there's a lot of scientists out there who are trying to forecast that and they're not very good at it uh, historically, but we can use their forecasts. And basically we can just say, look, let's just assume that the industry wide return on their R&D spending is 12%. And we back tested that and we looked over 25 years and we saw that over 25 years it was declining, but it was it was more or less above 12%. And so we said, let's assume a 12% return on R&D. Let's, it's got an 11 year life. If you spend a dollar on a preclinical drug today, it can produce revenue 11 years from now. And let's capitalize it as an asset on the balance sheet, assuming that the scientists at Merck and the scientists at Shearing Plow and at Eli Lilly and at Pfizer are all equally good, uh, which has historically been a pretty good assumption. And so we have historically bought pharmaceutical companies when people think that they are not capable of producing good drugs because they've had a string of failures and you can get them at a discount to the runoff value of their existing uh, portfolio. In this case, he said, you know, we can run off the DreamWorks portfolio. We can say, here's the value of the film library, and we can assume a return on the R&D spend, the content creation, and let's just put it in that model. And I said, you know, I don't even know if you're right, but I love the way you're thinking, and you're hired. Um, it turns out that the model he built did forecast the DreamWorks takeout price pretty accurately, although we did not own it. Um, but trust me when I say that no DreamWorks analyst on the sell side was comparing it to a pharmaceutical company because everybody is insistent upon breaking the market down into these little subsectors so that it becomes easier to analyze when in fact they start losing their pattern recognition skills and they go really deep into a vertical without a really good frame of reference for cash flows. Um, so we like, to, uh, we like to have a team of generalists. Um, another good thing about a team of generalists, by the way, uh, is um, you, know, you, you can have a portfolio manager retire at some point. And we've had a number of portfolio managers retire from the, from the founding partners to Ralph Wanger and we had Robert Sanborn and Bill Nygren and, and Clyde McGregor, Bob Levy. We just, we just keep, you know, it, 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 by definition, uh, uh, you have a career that spans a certain number of decades, uh, but your firm, you would like to last for a long, long time. Uh, if you have a great portfolio manager and they retire and you want to replace them and you have sector analysts, then you're getting your bank analyst, who's your best analyst, let's say, and you're saying, okay, you're our portfolio manager. I hope you can compare Caterpillar to Campbell's Soup to Calpine to CarMax uh, because that's what a portfolio manager does. And in that situation, you've really created an enormous amount of key man risk. Whereas if you have a team of generalists who spend their careers comparing companies across industries, then when you do have an opening in portfolio management, you have a really good idea of who's likely to be a good portfolio manager because they have a multi-decade track record as an analyst of comparing companies across industries. Uh, so we think that's very important. If you have a very short time horizon, if you're not an investor and you're one of these firms that is just trying to forecast which stock is going to go up, it makes sense to have sector analysts. Because if all... Folks, looks like we might have lost Win here. Bear with us for just a moment while we see if we can get him reconnected here. Give us just a moment, if you wouldn't mind.
Alrighty, everyone, we have Win back after a brief little bit of technical difficulty there, but we will go ahead and dive back into things now. Yeah, um, so I said at the beginning of the presentation that I'm, I'm looking forward to doing these things in person. Uh, not once in person have I accidentally fallen off the stage or into a hole or had the uh, power go out. Uh, however, we did have a technical difficulty there, which I am not equipped to solve. So um, uh, different background, we have a continuity error, but I'm in my office on my iPad and hopefully we can just keep going uh, the way we were. Um, uh, so uh, the last, I, I, I was in the middle of a point that, I, that may come back to me, but the last thing that I want to uh, talk about um, and I really had very, very few slides left because I'm not a slide kind of guy, so don't worry that you're not seeing them. The last point I wanted to make uh, was currently, as I'm listening to analyst candidates um, in interviews, because of what the market has been doing over the past four or five years, I am hearing more and more focus on it doesn't matter what the business is selling for. What matters are the moats. What is what is the what are the competitive advantages of the business? Is it a compounder? Does it have a flywheel? What are the barriers to entry? Basically, I'm hearing more and more people say that it doesn't really matter what you pay for a business if it's a good enough business and you hold it for a long enough period of time, uh, you are bound to be successful. Um, I don't think this could possibly be true mathematically. Uh, I do think that there are some businesses that will do very well held over very long periods of time, but entry point matters a lot. Um, you know, there, there's a lot of academic data indicating that the best companies in the world in the early 1970s uh, were trading for the same value that they were worth in the mid 1990s uh, because they were overvalued in the 70s. And there's a lot of data that indicates that you can't very easily forecast what the winners of 2040 are going to look like here in 2021. Um, it, it's the further out in time you get, the harder it is to forecast cash flows. And uh, as valuable as as valuable as research in motion was, um, and it looked like the most impenetrable moat imaginable: software, security. Uh, technology, everything, it fell apart when something new came about. Uh, and same with Eastman Kodak and same with, um, you know, and, and so for what it's worth, uh, I think that low discount rates have really driven this environment. Uh, the lower the interest rate, the more future cash flows are worth and the more you can essentially pay up for growth mathematically. Uh, but it's distressing to me as the director of research of a, of a value investing shop that candidates who have selected us as a, as a potential destination for their career uh, have decided that there's really no price too high to pay for a great business. Um, I think the market has taught us that over the past few years, but I don't think the market has taught us that over any long period of time and it will continue not to do that. Um, so that was the that was essentially the third slide. Uh, I wanted to talk about a few stocks specifically uh, because uh, I think everybody likes to hear about stocks. Um, and the, uh, and again, although theoretically I have a few slides, they don't really say anything but the name of the company. Uh, and I can, uh, I can say that to you now, so you're not missing anything uh, there. Um, so the three companies I want to talk about are Humana, uh, Keurig, Dr. Pepper, and Charter Communications. Um, these are all companies that we own here uh, at Oakmark, at Harris Associates, uh, that look uh, uh, relatively attractive to us at current prices. Um, Humana, first off, Humana is essentially a near pure play in Medicare Advantage. Uh, Medicare Advantage is, is one of the fastest growing areas of healthcare thanks to essentially the aging of uh, the population and the uh, tailwind of seniors that are choosing Medicare Advantage instead of traditional Medicare. 
very importantly, unlike a lot of the healthcare value chain that's out there, uh, this appears to really be saving us money as a society. Basically, the government sets the reimbursement, they set it at a, at a low level, and then they tell these companies, United Healthcare, Humana, Aetna, et cetera, they tell them, if you can manage the care of these customers at a lower cost than the price that we're paying you, then you can keep the profits. And the price they're paying is equivalent to what they would be doing themselves, uh, essentially reimbursing for care in terms of Medicare. And so Medicare Advantage seems to be societally good, and Humana is essentially taking enormous share of the, of the health insurance market. This is a company that the market is valuing today at about $62 billion. Notice that when I talk about value, I'm not talking about the price per share. Because if you're thinking like an owner, you're thinking about in aggregate, what is the business worth? I think a lot of people are so focused on share price that they forget that it represents a piece of the business. And so when we think about any of these companies, we think about what they're worth as an enterprise today in the market. And the market's valuing Humana at about $62 billion, which is about $440 a share. We think that they're going to earn four and a half to five and a half billion dollars of cash of, of pre-tax cash flow over the next couple of years per year. Uh, and so essentially they're trading for about 13 to 14 times that, uh, that cash flow multiple. This is a company that is in the top quintile of growth in the S&P, trading at a substantial discount to the S&P's multiple on cash flow and at a discount to what people appear to be paying in the private market for Medicare Advantage businesses. Uh, we are very happy to buy it at this price. Occasionally, people get very worried about the political environment and say, okay, people are going to change the rules on, on Medicare Advantage. But in our mind, it's one of the most protected parts of the healthcare ecosystem because it's drafting off of Medicare prices, which are very, very low, and it's proving to reduce the cost of care to the, to the government and to society. And it's proven that seniors really like this product. And so we think that if people try to touch it and mess it up, that a very large contingent of active voters would be against it. Uh, and so whenever this gets cheap for political reasons, and it looks pretty cheap right now, just on a cash flow basis, uh, uh, we get interested. And this is, a, this is a good price for Humana right now. Um, the second stock I want to talk about is uh, Keurig Dr. Pepper. Um, this is a very interesting company. You know, coffee is one of the most attractive consumer packaged good candidates. Uh, you know, coffee has, as some of y'all might be aware, a bit of an addictive uh, nature to it in terms of caffeine. Um, it can be drunk across many different day parts. Uh, it's all natural, it's low calorie, uh, it's appealing to a broad number of demographics. And Keurig obviously has, is a classic razor, razor blade model. Um, it, it has an installed base of 33 million units out there right now. Uh, it dominates the single serve category. It's a very fast growing category. And 80, 80 to 85% of the pods that are manufactured and sold today are Keurig branded are from this company. Uh, so that's an attractive business. Meanwhile, Dr. Pepper has been taking share for 20 years. Uh, consumers increasingly seem to be preferring flavors over colas. Um, they've done a really good job of, of taking share and building on their distribution assets. The way I'm describing this, by the way, without a valuation component to it, would end an interview right here in this office with me because it, you can tell it's an attractive business. The question is, what is it worth and what are you paying for it? Uh, it's currently trading in the market for about $63 billion, uh, $36 a share. This $63 billion, we think it's going to earn about $4 billion of EBIT, so pre-tax uh, uh, cash flow. Um, so it's trading for around 15 times its cash flow, a little more than that. Importantly, we have a long history of private market transactions in both the coffee space and the, and the uh, soda space. 
Um, since 2013, there have been more than $60 billion of coffee-related deals uh, struck at an average multiple of more than 21 times cash flow. Uh, so basically, we are seeing regular, just like the Tiffany LVMH deal, we're seeing regular repeated transactions that indicate to us that strategic buyers would, would, would pay more for this asset than it's currently trading. Um, so taking the leverage into account, if you convert the, the current stock price from enterprise value, you know, we say, okay, it's $36. It's probably worth, you know, 10 bucks more than that, pretty, pretty comfortably looking at private market values. And importantly, it should grow uh, in excess of the discount rate while paying, uh, you know, a one and a half, two percent yield uh, all along. Uh, interesting, good company, uh, diversifying to our portfolios because there are a lot of consumer products companies right now that look very expensive to us. Um, the last one I'll talk about is uh, is Charter Communications. Uh, this is a, a pretty long time holding for us here at Oakmark Harris. Um, this is essentially a monopoly. Uh, on two, in two thirds of its footprint. Uh, this is a monopoly on uh, providing broadband. It used to be video cable access, more and more it's internet high speed access uh, to households. Um, it essentially trades for about 14 and a half times uh, consensus cash flows looking out a couple of years. Um, they are, these are excellent stewards of capital. Uh, they continued to lever their growth through a share repurchase plan. And the multiple, which is essentially 14 and a half times, again, you see transaction after transaction that indicate that these uh, cable customers are worth quite a bit more than where the stock is currently trading. Uh, in fact, just last month, Cable One uh, spent $3 billion to buy Hargrave, which is a Southeastern cable company. Um, they basically paid seven and a half times current year revenue. Uh, we, if Charter traded for five times our estimate of revenue, uh, the stock would be worth, uh, you know, 50% more than where it currently trades. And so we look at a number of private market values of what people are willing to pay for similar assets. And, and we think this is an excellent price for this company. Um, so anyway, I gave you some back ground on the way we think about value, uh, on the way we think as generalists, uh, some stock picks. Uh, we had a uh, distressing technical uh, disruption in the middle there, so I don't know what that means for uh, uh, current viewership, but if you are watching that, uh, I appreciate your patience. A lot of you guys are going to see this online, and, and I assume it'll be edited. Uh, uh, some of that will be out. Um, at this point, I'm happy to, uh, to take questions. All righty, and it looks like our audience is starting to pump out some questions for us now. We do have a couple lined up here that we can go ahead and jump into. First up, first question we have in the list here, um, asking a little bit more uh, to help understand uh, your investment process, and specifically um, any calculations of intrinsic value, if you have any, um, as far as like an actual kind of like model or, or specific calculation there would go? So mathematically, the, the most accurate way to value a company is a discounted cash flow. It's a DCF. Unfortunately, if you've ever done a DCF, you realize that some of the inputs are notoriously uh, sensitive. Uh, so the discount rate that you use, the growth rate that you use, how many years of growth that you use, the further out you get, the more those inputs will dramatically affect the number that you get. And uh, honestly, it makes, you know, DCFs a little garbagey. And but they're not. They're technically the best way to look at a company. It's just that they're, it's very difficult to forecast all of the inputs precisely. So we like to triangulate our values. Uh, one is, and I keep emphasizing private market transactions, we want to see where strategic buyers have purchased similar assets and where strategic owners have sold similar assets, adjusted for the tax rates, because 
you know, selling something at a 30% tax rate is different than 20%. We also want to look at what the company's bonds are requiring in terms of return. So if a company's seven year bonds currently yield four and a half percent, then we certainly want to use a discount rate well in excess of that. Usually you want to use at least 300 uh, basis points above that. Um, uh, you know, we can, we can go quite a bit more than that. Uh, but you, you, you take a lesson from the fixed income markets there. Um, and then thirdly, if you're trying to pick the discount rate for one company, you might as well roll a dice. But if you model out hundreds of companies like we do, then you may not have McDonald's price, you might, might not have it precisely correct, but you have McDonald's rank ordered properly between HCA and Wells Fargo and CarMax and, and all of these different companies. And so if you essentially map all of your companies with appropriate gaps and discount rate to each other, then the most attractive ones will sort to the top of the list. Even if your absolute value is wrong, your relative values are gonna be pretty good. And uh, given that we tend to be fully invested, we want to own the most attractive available names. And so if we've got our discount rates scaled properly, the best names will end up sorting to the top. Absolutely. And continuing on there, um, you hit on it uh, in a couple different ways. Um, just question kind of expanding on that. Um, it, I believe we've, we've already uh, answered this for the most part, but is there a, a specific discount rate or a discount rate range that you're generally applying there? So, I mean, if you are a real estate investor, uh, you know, people think in, in terms of cap rates, you know, they say, okay, I, I'm, I'm spending a million dollars on this property and it is essentially going to produce $30,000 of cash flow and rent in a given year. So that's a 3% cap rate. The inverse of that is, you know, you'd be essentially paying 33 times earnings for that business. Um, bonds are the same way. You know, a 1% discount rate is 100 times earnings. Of course, there's no chance for growth because it's a consistent coupon. Um, we have to go to school based on the available alternatives to us. And, and the bond market is incredibly liquid. Uh, it, it's incredibly well analyzed and you can get very precise risk-free rates at, 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 in all sorts of currencies and all sorts of sovereign governments. And so we kind of know the, the bare minimum that people are willing to take. And then you can pile onto that real estate transaction, fixed income in terms of corporate bonds uh, industrial bond indices, and then basically, so, so, but, but in terms of a range that we use, uh, you know, we have to peg to what the, all, what the opportunity set looks like and the, and the, the treasury sort of sets that. And so we're using this different discount rates today than we did last year. They're a little bit higher and we're using dramatically different discount rates than we were using a few decades ago. They're quite a bit lower. Um, and that's just a function of the fact that we want to identify the best investments in today's market versus against a static uh, uh, benchmark that we would always use. Definitely. And continuing on uh, looking towards that investment model once again, I guess if you were to create a, a portfolio from scratch, for instance, you know, what would be those general steps that you would follow in narrowing down those investment opportunities and finding those best companies? So I want, I want to, I want to, there's a lot of different ways you could think about this. So, and I'm going to, I'm going to compare it to when you're hiring people, because I hire people. If you were, if I were building a firm from scratch and I had to hire 12 analysts, um, I would need to go out and I would need to interview a lot of people to find the best analysts that I could find. Uh, if I chose to interview 13 people to hire 12, I would, I would get rid of who I think the worst one is. If I interviewed a thousand people to get 12, 
then I would have gotten rid of, you know, the, the worst 988 of them in, in my estimation. If you're constructing a portfolio, you need to have a, a, a universe of names that you have some sense of what they're worth so that when you're selecting the best ones, you aren't just getting, you aren't just avoiding the very worst ones, you know? And, and so uh, constructing a portfolio from scratch for a new investor is a real challenge because every company you look at, you know, you start out looking at your first one and then your second one and then your third one. Uh, honestly, it takes a long time and a lot of reps to get the mosaic of companies kind of in your head so that you can construct a, a diversified portfolio of 12, 15 companies across a few different sectors. Um, so you kind of have to have that in your backdrop. Uh, the more companies you look at, the more likely you're going to have an interesting, uh, well-constructed portfolio. So, so don't, don't rush that uh, process. Um, from a company specific basis, if I'm looking at a, a universe of names and I want to know where do I start, uh, I generally look at names that have not done extraordinarily well in the stock market over the past couple years because people like to look at those names. Um, that's not to say they wouldn't be good investments, but I want to fish in inefficient ponds. And the better a company has done in the stock market, the more likely that more and more people are looking at it and the more likely that they are building models on it and the more likely I am not going to have a, an epiphany that nobody else has about this business. Uh, but if a company has been underperforming, but not dramatically, you know, it's not, a, it's not, it's not valiant at its lows, it's not a battleground, it's just been a, a, a slow underperformer um, and it's not in a lot of indices and, and, and I can feel fairly confident that applying work to this company could provide incremental value. And so I like to kind of screen for companies that have been somewhat laggards. And then I like to look at the cash flow that they produced. I like to focus on gross margin as a sign that they're selling a good that people really want to pay for. A very thin gross margin means that you need to have a super efficient business. You can have a good business, but you need to be very efficient. A fat gross margin means that somebody else has not come in there and attacked your business in a way that is, is eating at your economics. A grocery store has very thin gross margins. Tiffany has very fat gross margins. I generally find that that if you look at underperforming businesses with, with high gross margins, you're in a fun area, you know? And then you can start, I, I like good balance sheets so that I'm not stressed out by being wrong could lead to a bankruptcy. Being wrong just leads to underperformance. There's other things you can apply, but that's kind of the way I like to run initial screens um, if, if given a universe I haven't looked at before. Definitely. And next question here, why do you use pre-tax cash flow? And is there a specific way that you're calculating it that might differ from other people? So we, we look at pre, pre-tax pre-interest um, because if a company gets acquired, so let's say a company with a ton of debt gets acquired by a company with a ton of cash. The company, the company with a ton of cash can essentially impose their capital structure on the company that used to have a lot of debt, but now has been swallowed up. And so the interest expense that we were seeing uh, ends up not having been a permanent characteristic of that business. It was something that an acquirer could change. Uh, the tax rate is similar in the sense that if you are acquiring businesses from a jurisdiction that had a 21% tax rate and you bought a company that for some reason had much higher taxes, there's a chance that, that you could actually get a different tax rate on those, on those businesses by deploying various tax strategies. To be honest, that used to be more of a thing than it currently is. And so we look at a company's pre-interest, pre-tax cash flows, thinking about it from the standpoint of a generic acquirer. 
But then when we think about the multiple that we use on the business, we do apply a tax rate that we think is representative of the business. So a company like CarMax, who I've mentioned a few times that pay a lot of state and local taxes, is going to have a higher tax rate than a company like Honeywell that has a lot of international businesses and you know, R&D offsets and things like that. So, so we, we're more interest rate agnostic uh, for an individual business than we are tax rate agnostic. Understood. And looks like we have a, a question here looking specifically at, at Dr. Pepper and looks like the viewers seeing a cash flow growth uh, negative 25%, negative 5% over five years and 10 years. You know, if these cash flows are, are negative, how should viewers go about kind of calculating the value of these businesses? So what you want to look at essentially is, is obviously forward-looking projections. Um, the, one thing that, that that is anathema to me somewhat again in an interview is when somebody says the company typically trades for 15 times earnings and is currently trading for 11 times earnings because historic multiples are using historic fundamentals and historic competitive environments and historic all sorts of stuff, discount rates, tax rates, et cetera. Um, you know, the analogy always is that Eastman Kodak was trading at a big discount to its old historic multiples before it, before the earnings disappeared. Um, in the case of backward looking Kirk, Dr. Pepper, the business has been built through a series of acquisitions. Uh, they've also have been some divestitures. Uh, when we look at essentially the EBITDA line for the business, trying to normalize for non-recurring uh, items. Uh, in 2019, the EBITDA was about $2.9 billion. In 2020, it was about $3.1 billion. The estimates for 2021 are about $3.5 billion. Uh, and we think that in a couple of years, it will probably be around $4 billion. And so uh, adjusting for a lot of one-time things that no question exist in the data downloads that you get online uh, and that would stop me from looking at a company too, unless you pick the financials apart. So I'm sympathetic to seeing the headline numbers and saying, well, this is not a good business. You know, we, we have to, you know, our analysts have to model those out and adjust for them and essentially say the business as currently configured has this historic growth rate, as opposed to what was reported in those years, which has a lot of stuff that won't look like 2023 in them. Um, you know, you have to scrub data downloads a lot and it's time consuming. And, and there's so many interesting companies to look at out, out there that I can't tell people that the best thing to do is go scrub all historic data downloads for one-time items uh, because uh, you'll, you'll, you can just find something else in a lot of cases that don't require that kind of, that kind of auditing type of work. Absolutely. And we, we hit a couple times on um, some multiples and things like that. Do you have a, a favorite multiple to look at when, when considering companies? So when I'm evaluating acquisitions that have occurred, if I have the data in front of me, I like to look at the enterprise value to the gross margins, to the, gro to the gross profits. Because like I said, that's what the business has earned. And that's something that acquiring companies have a hard time changing. I don't, in an, in an acquisition scenario, I don't really like to look at the further down the income statement you get, the less meaningful the, the multiple is because of synergies. A company will buy another company and fire all the salespeople and tear out the IT and put their new systems in and, and sell their headquarters. And, and so it'll look like a high multiple of EBIT, but in reality, it's a low multiple of EBIT adjusting for synergies. The further up the income statement you get, the less the acquiring company can do. And so the more valuable that data is when you're trying to say what a company got bought for. That's on PMVs. For actual, actually analyzing a business, I do the opposite. I go really far down the income statement and, and really want to get at what are the sustainable cash flows. Um, so after all of the company's uh, cost of goods sold, selling, general administrative, R&D, interest, you know, and, and you just really want to see what are the cash flows that you as the owner of the business are going to get access to. 
In reality, you don't get access to them. The management team and the board of directors typically allocates those cash flows back into the business or into M&A or share repurchase or dividends or, or things like that. And so in addition to forecasting the cash flows, uh, you need to assess whether they are good stewards of this capital, which is a big part of the job as well. Absolutely. And just to throw a name out there, uh, since we only have the the one question showing up in chat today, our, our viewers are, have been increasingly uh, getting better at not just tossing company names out there for evaluation. But since we just have the one today, we'll we'll go ahead and toss it out to you. Um, any insight on, on Alibaba as it's currently priced? And if you're not specifically involved, no problem there. Yeah, as the domestic director of research, um, uh, I will refrain from talking about companies that we don't actually cover. Um, yeah, I, I kind of have to leave. I, I'm trying to think. I, if I were sitting down for a beer with you, we could talk about it all day long, but I'm trying to think of who from my compliance department might be watching the video <laughs> later. Uh, and so um, uh, I, I don't want to bartend again, although it was a fun job. That was, uh, that was another lifetime ago. So I'll, I'll refrain from talking about that one. Uh, but if it's a domestic holding that, that you know that we do own, I, I'm happy to speak to it. Absolutely. And we, we totally understand the answer there. Yeah. Um, as far as audience questions are going to go, that's going to round them out. But one that we always like to throw out there, a lot of times uh, in these presentations, especially, we always hit a lot on buying companies and hitting on the buy side of things. What would ever lead you to sell a company or how would you reach kind of that, that point as far as the, your path of logic would go? So you have to know your opportunity set. Um, in the depths of the financial crisis in 2008, we were selling companies at 60% of our estimate of their value to buy companies at 25% of our estimate of their value. The opportunity set was so incredibly inexpensive that a company selling for a little more than half of what we thought it was worth was a source of funds to, to acquire names at a much cheaper price. Today's market does not look like that. Uh, you know, in all honesty, uh, with the increase in discount rates, with the likely long-term increase in tax rates, uh, with the performance of the stock market, um, you know, the, 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 the typical company that we're looking at today that's attractive is selling for, you know, 60 to 70 percent of what we think it's worth. And given that our error band on what we think a company is worth is, you know, 20 percent because it's, it's difficult to peg precisely, if you're selling a company at 80% at of what it's worth to buy one at 70% of what it's worth, you have no statistical significance whatsoever. You know, you need to be able to see daylight between your estimate of what you think this business is worth and what you think this one is worth so that the chance that you're wrong is taken into account in a way that you are still making a good decision, uh, taking the transaction cost and the capital gain taxes and everything else into consideration. Um, so we do have a sell discipline, uh, but it's driven by what's available to purchase today. What's the most attractive thing we do not currently own? And how does it stack up versus the least attractive thing that we do currently own? Uh, and and that, is a, that is a constantly changing thing depending on the market environment. Absolutely. And it looks like we had a, a few more questions roll in here real quick. We'll we'll hit one on a, a clarification, and then we'll go ahead and end things out as far as questions go. Uh, looks like our, our one of our viewers here, Richard, uh, just asked him for clarification. Uh, do you use uh, EV to EBIT or EV to EBITDA? Uh, we actually use EV to EBITDA. So we think that in a steady state, depreciation and capex, depreciation and maintenance capex should approximately be equivalent. And that is a real cash cost to the business. So we don't like to add depreciation back um, because that is, even if they're not spending it today, that is gonna come due at some point if they want the business to run the way it does today. Uh, uh, amortization, however, is not a cash cost. 
Uh, that is simply an accounting function from prior transactions that the company did, assuming they don't have to do these transactions every year to sustain the business, then this is something that will disappear over time and does not need to be respent on the in the cash flow statement. So our typical metric is EV to EBITDA. Um, but you have to adjust the depreciation. A lot of companies, you know, railroads spend way more CapEx than they depreciate because their assets are incredibly old and a lot of them are fully depreciated, but they still have to put a ton of capital into it. So you have to act, EBITDA does not properly account for depreciation in a railroad. Uh, and then there's other businesses, you know, it, it, it's company specific, but EBITDA is our kind of preferred line. For sure. And thanks for that uh, clarification there. And the last one we'll, we'll go ahead and hit on here, which I think will be a good one for us to end on. Uh, if you were coming in kind of blank slate, new investor in this really kind of high PE environment, seeing tech companies go to these crazy, crazy numbers, would you feel like it would be a time to invest or do, do you see the options to invest or do you think these investors should kind of hold out for, for things to calm down a little bit? We, you know, we have been students of the market for our whole careers and we know for a fact that we would be terrible, terrible market timers. Um, and we also know for a fact that going back to 1991, the number of times that we viscerally felt like we would want to sell the market as opposed to own the most attractive stocks we could find at that point in time, um, we would have we would have we would have subtracted a lot of value had we been had we tried to go in and out of the market. You, if you're looking to invest, you have to look across your opportunity set, and stocks are a part of it, bonds are a part of it, real estate is a part of it. Uh, you know, your uncle who is buying another car that he's going to use as an Uber is part of it. I mean, you have to look across what kind of cash flow yields can you get across many, many different investments. While we do see that the headline multiples to the stock market are pretty high right now, there are a number of companies out there paying a dividend yield in excess of the treasury yield with growth potential, which the treasury, of course, payments will not grow, um, that are good inflation pass-throughs. If you're worried about you know dollar devaluation or, or inflation in some sense, owning a percent of a company is still a percent of the same company in any inflation environment. And so historically equities have been good inflation pass-throughs. If you, if you look at your opportunity set, we think that, uh, that you can find equity investments right now, not necessarily across all of technology, which is a very uh, picked over and in some cases unattractive space, depending on the company, although we own many technology investments. Um, we think that you can find some pretty attractive, re relatively attractive equity ideas right now. Uh, and, and we do not see it as, you know, that, that the fixed income market or the real estate market is more attractive by any stretch today. And that's our opportunity set. Absolutely. Well, that is going to round out our questions today. Uh, for those of you out in the audience, we will have a full recording hanging out here on our YouTube channel as well as on GuruFocus.com. If you missed anything, you want to look back, anything like that, it'll be waiting there for you. So please do go ahead and take a peek. Uh, if you did like everything today, please go ahead, give the video recording a like once we finish up here. Comment your favorite part. And if you do want to hang out for some more future comment, go ahead and subscribe to the channel. Outside of that, I want to put a thank you out to our audience for asking great questions, and it's been an absolute pleasure today, Wynn. We're really appreciative of you taking the time to join us and answer these questions from our audience. Sure, it's fun. Thank you. Absolutely. Well, we'll wish you well, and we wish our audience well, and that'll round things out for us today.